our security. All right, Dr. Day, go ahead and. Okay, we're good. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, April 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Indian River County Planning and Zoning. Uh, thank you for your patience as we went through uh, the technical difficulties. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. <coughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, none. Uh, look for approval of the minutes of the April 8th, 2021 meeting. Motion. Second. Motion to approve and second. By motion to approve by Beth and seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. The um, agenda item tonight is a um, uh, uh, agenda item that's not on consent. Uh, I'll read it into the record. It is State Road 60 and 74th Avenue convenience store with gas sales. And it is a request for a major site plan and administrative use approval for automotive fuel sales with a convenience store. Buildex Incorporated is the owner. Blackfin Partners Investments is uh, Incorporated is the applicant. Uh, Bowler Engineering Florida LLC is the agent. Uh, this site is located at the northwest corner of State Road 60 and 74th Avenue. The zonings are CN, Neighborhood Commercial, and PRO, PRO, Professional Office District. Land use designation is M1, medium density, residential one, up to eight units per acre. Uh, and this is a quasi-judicial uh, item. Are there any ex, ex parte communications uh, on the board? No. No, uh, none. Uh, so anyone who would like to speak tonight, please stand and be sworn in. How do you have to be sworn in? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, thank you. And staff, uh, will you do your presentation, please? M Mr. Chair, if I could just real quick. Um, there should be, I believe there's two or three folks on the conference call, so just real quick, um, can I just, if someone could just confirm that you can hear us and that you are on the call? Yes, we're here. All right, thank you. Um, we can hear. I'll do a just quick roll call just so we have an idea of, of who, whom we are dealing with. Um, can the, the first person that just spoke, could you uh, just state your name so we have an idea of who, who's on the call? Betty Walsh. Okay. Pe Anita Penny? Williams. Okay, next person? Barbara Barr. Barbara, and then uh, there was one other person that spoke instead of Barbara. John Ripsick. Tom. Okay. Is that it? John. Oh, John. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. John. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. <clears throat> and if you could, could mute your uh, your mics or, or um, keep it down in the background, we can hear the background on the phones. Good evening. For the record, my name is John Stoll. I'm a senior planner with the Community Development Department for Indian River County. The request tonight is for an administrative permit use approval for automotive fuel sales with a convenience store. The project's known as State Road 60 and 74th Avenue Convenience Store. Uh, this is the location map showing the site at the northwest corner of State Road 60 and 74th Avenue. The site is split zone, neighborhood commercial, and professional office. This is an aerial of the site showing the current site conditions. And as you can see, the site is currently undeveloped. This is the site plan showing a proposed 4,791 square foot car wash. Oh, so sorry, give me a store. An 869 square foot car wash and a fueling island with canopy and 16 fueling positions. This is the traffic circulation plan and you can see two new driveway connections, a uh, full movement connection for 74th Avenue, and a right-in, right-out connection for State Road 60. 
The applicant is required to install uh, a northbound left turn lane for the 74th Avenue connection and a westbound left turn lane for the state or the right turn lane for the State Road 60 connection. There's a two-way drive aisle that moves around and through the site. 90 degree parking on the north, west, and south of the convenience store and more parking on the south side of the fuel island. The car wash will queue in the southeast and exit to the northeast of the convenience store. Uh, this is the landscape plan showing two 20 foot wide type C buffers on the north and the west side of the, of the property, a 20 foot wide 74th Avenue buffer and a 20 foot wide State Road 60 buffer. There are also foundation plannings around the convenience store and next to the car wash. Um, improvements and other conditions, the uh, aforementioned turn lanes are for 74th Avenue and State Road 60. Uh, there will be external sidewalk modifications on 74th Avenue and State Road 60. A required internal sidewalk and pedestrian system to connect the internal part of the site with the external sidewalks. Site lighting, and the site is subject to the State Road 60 corridor regulations for building and site design. Additionally, automotive fuel sales in the CN district are subject to specific land use requirements in section 971.452 of the land development regulations. As for staff recommendations, staff recommends that the Planning and Zoning Commission grant administrative permit use approval with the conditions stated in the staff report related to buffers and landscape improvements, internal sidewalk construction and external sidewalk improvements, and off-site 74th Avenue and State Road 60 improvements. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, John. Um, are there Commissioner, questions for staff at this time? I just, I do have one quick question. Um, <clears throat> looking at attachment three, the diagram, I'm just curious, if you start at the store and look to the west, there's kind of a big open area right there. What, what is going to be in that area? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Ryan Sweeney, Chief of Current Development. Uh, it's a good question. Right now, it's a, it is a vacant area. There is no proposed use. This approval would not include any use approval for that area. Um, so it, it, it depends on if they can fit something there and, and what that would be. It would have to be subject to zoning. But right now, it's just a reserved vacant area. And there would be a landscape buffer up that west boundary and across the north boundary. 274th Avenue, is that right? Yeah, okay. Yes. Keeps going. Yeah. yeah, and there's there's an interim sort of buffer in between the, the drive aisle there as well. Any other questions? Um, so uh, at this time, I will um, open the floor for public comment and public questions. Um, it looks like there's a lot of interest in this. I ask if your point has been made three or four times. There's probably no need to make it a fifth time. Um, and will you please, there's a podium on both sides. Um, state your name clearly and your address if you are coming up uh, to speak. Uh, thank you. Yep. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Doug Vitunak. Um, I don't know what's your preference, if I take the mask off when I speak up here or... Sure, go ahead and take it off. Okay, yep. Thanks. I find these things annoying, honestly. <laughs> um, like I say, I represent the applicant, Blackfin, uh, and I want to say first and foremost that staff did a terrific job on this project. My team's worked very hard with the county uh, and their staff for many months to meet the requirements of your code and uh, meet and exceed the requirements of the code, in fact, as you see in the staff report. They've addressed all the staff comments um, to the staff satisfaction, and that's why we get a recommendation for approval here from the staff. They are not a rubber stamp. They look at the application very carefully, and uh, frankly, so do my developer clients when they put a development in or put an application for development in like this. Um, they are concerned um, about making sure that the impacts of this development are as little as possible on any neighboring properties. Um, so uh, this would be one of the few, if not the only gas station on the north side of Route 60 as you leave Indian River Boulevard and head west until you get to this site. And so I think there's a need for it on that side. It will keep, people won't have to go all the way further down, 
or cross 60 over to the left-hand side to get gasoline. So there's a need in our community for this project. Uh, the applicant uh, has done everything in their power to limit impact to the neighboring properties from lighting from the site. Now, every site has to be lit. There are code requirements that talk about that. But we have a detailed uh, lighting plan that is, uh, is meant to minimize that. And in a moment, I'll have our engineer, uh, Kyle, come up here and talk a little bit about the lighting plan and <coughs> what, the, what the light will be at the property line, which I think you'll find interesting and, and um, I think you'll find appropriate. We've got also significant perimeter buffering. In fact, the plan is a 20-foot type C buffer to the north and the west. I think uh, that's what's showing there on the plan, in fact. And what it is is a double row hedge with a shade tree in front, understory in front of that. So uh, there's a fairly opaque buffer that will be put in here in between our property and the uh, ACT community. Also, you'll see on the plan that the uh, gas pump and canopy and the car wash are situated, uh, well, in the, in the in uh, terms of the car wash, it's, it's behind the store. And in terms of the canopy, it's about as far away as it can possibly be from the neighboring community. Um, key in this project uh, is that the retail convenience use is a permitted use under your code. We meet all the requirements. We're entitled to approval for that. Um, a lot of the concerns we think you'll hear, and some of which were brought up in a letter by Council for ACT, um, are the same for a convenience type use as they are for a gas station use, which is the administrative approval that's needed. So evaluate it in terms of that. What you're, what you're not looking at is what's the difference between a vacant piece of property and this development. But what you're looking for, what's the difference between the convenience use, which is allowed, and the gas station use. So that's, I think, a critical point in your evaluation of this application tonight. <clears throat> and uh, traffic's been engineered and approved by county traffic and fire prevention. We have a traffic engineer here, Sean McKenzie, who will, in a moment, talk to you about the uh, traffic plan for the site and the fact that it's the safest available. And um, so with that, I'd like to ask uh, Kyle, our engineer, to come up here and say a few things. And Kyle, I'd like you to first start out with the, um, the lighting plan and talk about that and what the lighting plan shows. Absolutely. And first introduce yourself and tell us about your credentials. Absolutely. For the record, Kyle Morrell, Bowler Engineering, 3820 Northdale Boulevard, um, <clears throat> engineer of record for this project. So. Specific to the lighting plan, what we've done is we have a photometric design that provides um, safe illumination through the site. However, it dissipates as you get closer to the property line. So at the property line to the west and to the north, there's actually zero foot candles. Uh, foot candle being the unit of measure, which is essentially one candle one foot away uh, to illuminate an area uh, of one square foot. So at the property line, it's, it's zero on the north and the west. Related to the landscape buffer, um, as previously mentioned, we do have a double row uh, trees, uh, type C buffer, 20 foot wide. Um, from our canopy to the property line, we have roughly 200 feet to the property line. And then there's another 107 feet uh, before the first units on the west. Uh, but in addition, the western units also have mature oaks. And there's a six foot tall uh, masonry wall on top of a three or four, four foot tall berm. So in all, when you're out there standing next to it, it's eight to nine feet tall. So that'll be additional screening from our property. And then on the north, there's some uh, additional trees and uh, approximately a five foot tall uh, masonry wall. Um, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you, Kyle. Oh, unless you have questions. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Any questions? 
I have just a couple of quick questions. Um, number one, are there any outdoor speakers associated with this project? Not to my knowledge, not for the, not for the convenience store. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not aware of any speakers that are there on the C store. Um, however, it is, uh, the, the C store alone is a permitted use. So specific to just the administrative, uh, use tonight for the, um, for the fuel canopies, the only speakers are on the actual, um, fueling dispensers, uh, that may sometimes play music as, as I'm sure we've all heard it. <clears throat> Ryan, are you comfortable that whatever noise comes out of those speakers on the fuel dis fuel units will not carry into these neighborhoods? Uh, uh, Dr. Dayan, I, I mean, th to the extent that I buy fuel and they're usually at a, a speaking yeah. volume, yes, but I, I, I'm not, a, <clears throat> unless they're unusually loud, I w yeah, I would be comfortable with, with that, compa you know, compared to the road noise from State Road 60, yes. The uh, car wash. <clears throat> what kind of noise does that make? It, it should just be a standard car wash that has, um, you know, you drive through, it's got the, the equipment on side that cleans your car. And um, this one specifically probably has a, a blower or a dryer. Um, however, the car wash is allowed by current use. Um, so I don't, I don't have any information specific to the car wash tonight to present. And, and I guess I'll just throw the question out to either staff or, or to the applicant, but <clears throat> I, I don't have a clear understanding of whether everything you're asking for is a permitted use under our zoning code or whether some of it is not permitted or is subject to any level of discre discretion. Uh, maybe I could jump in. Uh, Alan, I, so... I think what you're, I think kind of what you're going towards is the criteria and the, the approval process for administrative permit use versus permitted and then ultimately special well, exception. Ultimately what I'm trying to resolve in my own mind, <clears throat> let's say we didn't like this project, sure. but let's say it's a permitted use under our zoning code. If it's a permitted use under our zoning code, at least my thinking is I don't have the right to say no if they're otherwise complying with the regulations. So that's kind of my question. Is, is what they're asking for a permitted use that they have a right to have as long as they meet all the other requirements of the code? Right, so I'll, briefly, and, and I'll let Dylan jump in if, if I'm going <laughs> down the wrong track, that the specific reason why we're here in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission is for the automotive fuel sales component, the gasoline, the gas pumps. And that is a, an administrative permit use which is subject to certain criteria. So long as they meet those criteria, which are outlined in the staff report, um, you'd be hard pressed not to be able to, to not approve it. Okay. Is that? And, and I know Ryan included them, <clears throat> but for the benefit of everybody here is administrative fuel sales, administrative permit. No, automotive fuel sales, administrative permit. A, districts requiring administrative permit approval pursuant to the provisions of CN addition. So that's, those are the districts that are allowed by administrative permit. B, additional information requirements. So that's not approval things, just things that have to be submitted. And then C, actual criteria in the code. And there are four. So the first criteria, all automotive fuel sales shall be accessory to a limited retail sales establishment. Number two, the fuel pumping area, including vehicle staging areas, shall be a minimum of 30 feet from the retail establishment and in no case may encroach upon other minimum parking and or driveway areas. Three, no automotive repair or maintenance activities shall be permitted. And four, the location of all gasoline storage tanks and facilities shall be subject to all applicable standards of the National Fire Protection Association, otherwise known as NFPA. So those are the four criteria that basically staff reviews, makes sure it meets, brings it to the Planning and Zoning Commission to make sure that staff's done their review right and that they meet all the criteria. And Ryan, let me know if I've if I've missed any of the criteria. So that that to hopefully answer your question. Thank you. Now, 
I, I do actually have a question for Ryan on some of the things that, that Kyle had mentioned, so I might be a little bit out of turn or out of order here. I heard a reference to a, a lighting plan, and I heard a reference to um, a wall and some height. Is there an equivalent lighting plan and maybe cross-section that is also part of this? Because I just saw a landscape plan and a site plan. Right. Um, well, so the, again, uh, Dylan, the, the graphics that you have are, are informational. They don't constitute the full plan set that is much bigger. <laughs> so you're right. <laughs> yes. So there's a lot more detail in the in the text. So then, so this approval would be subject to the the buffers, the landscape improvements, and the the other the description of of items that had been discussed. Right. There's a lot more technical information um, provided in these plan sets that our our staff report would be hundreds of pages long yeah. if we had to. Great. I just wanted to make sure that there was some evidence of of those statements. So going back to the four criteria. The staff has reviewed those and this project fulfills all four criteria. That's correct, yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, before I go on with my next uh, witness, um, Ryan, uh, Council Member Palakwich talked about the vacant area if that's going to be developed in the future an applicant or the owner would have to come back and do another site plan for that is that correct they get they need to go through another approval process uh, yes that's true i do want to be clear that if it's a permitted use it would be at the staff level approval so if it were an office space or or some other use that is permitted by right in the cn zoning district then it it could be approved at the staff level if it was an administrative permit or special exception use, it would come back before for you all, and ultimately, if there was special exception on the board. So there would be a level, depending on what the use right. is. Right. But if it was a permitted use and it met all the criteria sure. in the code. Correct. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I'd like uh, at this time to have Sean come up and talk with us. Sean McKenzie is our traffic engineer. Sean, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your qualifications and background? Uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, Sean McKenzie, 1172 Southwest 30th Street, Palm City, Florida. Um, I'm a professional engineer with McKenzie Engineering and Planning. Uh, I have approximately 20 years of experience in the field. Um, on this particular site, we performed a, in a, a study in accordance with the standards of the industry, as well as all the standards of Indian River County and their code. Um, obviously, you know, we're before, here, before you here today, we've uh, complied with all of those requirements. And in fact, we uh, performed really a very conservative study, and in those results, we are, you know, there's two points of access. There'll be a left turn lane going into the site from 74th Avenue. Um, the other item, which probably will have some discussion also, is the right turn lane uh, that we are constructing or extending into the property from State Road 60. Um, as a measure of um, the safety of the project, we are, in fact, slightly shortening the turn lane going into our neighborhood to the west. Our turn lane is going to be fully uh, compliant with FDOT standards. It's more than 185 feet long, which is the standard for a 45 mile an hour turn lane. Our neighbors to the west had a very extensively long turn lane. We are going to be shortening it, as I said, but their turn lane is still going to be approximately 250 feet long, which is 35 percent more than the standard for 100, you know, the, the 45 mile an hour turn lane. So we're still going to have uh, safe access to both properties, um, and the study is, does comply with all of the standards of Indian River County as well as the state of Florida. And Sean, is there an issue with uh, making one long turn lane? Right. One going into X, one going to the gas station. If, for folks on the conference call, we will give you an opportunity, but we're, we're, uh, we need to try to preserve order. It's hard. Um, to do that over the phone so just hold tight and we'll give you an opportunity to speak right um, one one thought that was brought up is to extend our turn lane and essentially have one continuous right turn lane that would enter both properties um, dot uh, examined that option i've examined that option and found it to be unsafe you would never want to have a driveway essentially off of a turn lane if it can be avoided because someone going into our neighborhood to the west uh, might be getting in the turn lane thinking I'm going to continue for another three or 400 feet to my property when in fact the person in front of you 
is slowing down and making that right turn into the, the gas station, uh, creating a, a right turn hazard. And uh, so we try to avoid those by creating two separate and distinct turn lanes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, any questions? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So we, we meet all the specific criteria of the code. They've, uh, a lot of experts have put a lot of time into making sure that this is a safe, compatible development that does meet the requirements of code or exceed, exceed the requirements of code. Um, uh, another point is we meet the State Road 60 requirements. And um, so with that, I'll take a seat. I would like to reserve some time to respond if there are any concerns. Uh, that may amount to any kind of evidence that we can talk about and encounter with our experts. But my, the bottom line is we meet the code. Um, this property is not going to be vacant forever. I understand that there's always a resistance to change or development for a, uh, a neighboring community like this. But the fact of the matter is uh, that the, the, the code is designed to protect neighbors, and when you meet it, you're supposed to get approved. So. Thanks very much for all of your time. I know you've been here <laughs> a, a lot recently, and that time is appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Please come forward if you'd like to speak. <clears throat> Could you pull up? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, let me go to. Good evening, Mary Solick, 121 South Orange Avenue, Suite 1500, Orlando, Florida. I'm outside counsel for Axe, who is the neighboring property owner to the west. With me tonight is George Bryan, who is the vice president for the Southeast region, Sean Fletcher, who is the vice president of real estate for Axe, and Scott Cairns, who is the executive director of the um, Indian River Estates, as well as many residents of Indian River Estates. Um, this is a, uh, it's not showing up that well. This is a map, uh, an aerial map that gives you the outlines of the um, Indian River Estates property. Are you guys going to be my little We're going to try. Uh, managers? <laughs> the, um, there we go. The vacant property outlined in blue is the subject property before you tonight. And then if you zoom back out, and you see the, the development that is uh, to the west and runs all the way up to 26th. All of that residential area there is the Indian River States community. It's almost 110 acres. Um, Axe purchased that property in 1985 and began developing that year. It is a, as you all know, a senior citizen retirement community. The last phase of that project was completed in 2012. Today, the, the community consists of 514 apartments in nine buildings, 20 villa-style buildings that are just on the west side of the subject property. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And another 30, uh, 70, 34 more villas on the northeast corner of the project. Indian River Estates is home to more than 850 residents. 25% of them have been there 10 years or longer. The community provides independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, and related services, and is a very robust and vibrant part of the Vero Beach community. Um, I am certain that this is not the first time that you have to, had to deal with the inherent conflict of putting commercial uses next to a residential community. Um, your comprehensive plan in Policy 1.4 requires you to address this issue and requires that your land development regulations contain um, provisions to make sure that adjacent land uses are compatible. And you do that through a variety of means, and this is not an exclusive list, but through the use of vegetative buffers, setbacks, open space, physical separation, regulation of lighting, and regulation of access, and hours of operation. And along those lines, I'm here on behalf of Axe tonight to ask you to consider a few modifications to the proposal in front of you to ensure that we, we get the uh, compatibility that your comprehensive plan requires. I'm going to list these items in, no, in order only of how much time I need to discuss each one and not in order of their importance. 
The first one is that we would very much like you to put a condition on this approval, limiting the hours of the car wash. And we've made a very reasonable request that the car wash not operate between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. We, um, I'm gonna go to the landscape buffer next, and if we could go to the aerial in your... You, would you prefer oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. That's, that's good. Oh, that, no, maybe the one in your one site that, plan that, yeah, yes. Right, we can do the one in our presentation. Uh, the, um, the gentleman for the developer described the existing buffers, but he had them backwards. Um, the, the, the higher wall is actually on the north side of the property with the um, oak trees that are on the Axe property. The buffer on the west side, the wall is separated from the property line and the, the uh, vegetative buffer in that uh, area is not quite as dense and mature as the existing buffer on the north side. We are asking that you require the developer to put in a type B buffer on the west side for a couple of reasons. One, I just mentioned the existing buffer on the Axe property is not as dense as the existing buffer on the north side. And the second reason is, as you have noted, there is a, a available developable area on this property. We don't know what that future use is going to be. At one point, there was a plan to put a medical office building there. And as your staff has advised you, if they come through with a permitted use, there wouldn't be another public hearing, and we wouldn't have an opportunity to come in and talk to you and address you about appropriate buffers. So we want that type B buffer, which is 30 feet in width, and a few more trees and a few more shrubs on the west side of the property to be a, a condition of approval tonight. Um, I'm gonna address the lighting. I had uh, thought I had seen all of the documents that were submitted as part of the application. I had not seen a lighting plan. I still haven't seen the lighting plan. Don't know what it says, don't know if it really says what they've told you it says, but we would like additional shielding on the west and north sides of that canopy to make sure that light is not bleeding over into the residential community. Those villas on the west side back up to this property and same with the villas on the north side. So we would ask for um, appropriate shielding on the canopy lighting. Mm -hmm. The, um, the last issue is, is uh, really the most important and it is a, the Axe community uh, does a very good job of taking care of the health and vitality of the residents on the property and they do uh, just a good, as good a job as making sure their residents are safe when they leave the property. This aerial, um, this shows it, but if you go to the other one, I wanna show you the decelerate or the right turn lane that exists now on State Road 50, there it is. And that right turn lane starts about the middle of the 7-Eleven property and heads due west. That entrance that you see is the primary entrance to Indian River Estates, and that entrance serves only Indian River Estates. And we are very concerned about the site plan configuration that separates those two, creates two separate turn lanes and creates a um, concrete curb bump out. And you can see that in the site plan attached to your staff report. We're very concerned about our elderly residents who are used to a traffic pattern that has existed all these years and having that changed. We do not want two separate right turn lanes. We want a single, right, a, a single deceleration lane along the whole frontage of the property. Now, I understand this is a DOT issue. This is DOT right away. You can't control that. It's, but it's showing on your site plan, and it was listed as a condition of approval that these, can, these certain improvements be made to State Road 60 and to, to uh, 74th. That's a, a right turn lane as well. So we would ask, and it's our understanding that the DOT permits have not been issued for these improvements. So we would ask that the site plan mm -hmm. that you are going to approve tonight be modified to remove those specific design elements of that right turn, those two right turn lanes, and that uh, that not be the ultimate configuration not be added to the site plan until such time as DOT has approved a design. And we'd like to work with DOT to make sure that we get the design that is the safest for our residents. So you have that as a condition of approval, but those improvements those have not been approved by DOT, and we don't think they should be part of 
your, that specific design should be part of your conditional approval tonight. We also would suggest that the driveway on State Road 60 be a write-in only and that all of the traffic exiting this 7-Eleven property come out on 74th. It is a street with lower traffic counts. We think that would be, that would make that deceleration safer as well. You wouldn't have folks coming out of the 7-Eleven and accelerating to get out ahead of people that are turning into Indian River Estates. So those are the requests that ACTS is making of you tonight for modifications to the site plan. There are residents here, I believe, that would also like to address or present concerns to you about the project. Do you have any questions for me or any of the leadership of ACTS? Yeah, I have a question about the picture that's on the screen right now showing the, that's the existing right turn lane. Yes. Is that what the right turn lane is going to look up, look like when this is built out? No. Can you? I'll, yeah, I'll do my best to try to show it. it they're going to split it. So they're going to they're going to add a separate right turn lane that that starts almost at the intersection of 74th and State Road 60, and comes into the property. And do you see that? See, this, curve? this is where the existing turn lane begins now. If you see that paint line, and then this everything in bold to the east is new. And then you also see this is the curb, this would be new curb that would sort of end the turn lane and then begin again with the taper. We're, we're concerned about our residents who are trained to access the property one way, now all of a sudden facing that concrete curb out there in the middle of what has been their right-hand turn lane for all these years. Like I said, the Axe folks are very, very uh, proactive on, ma on making sure that access to their property is safe. I know that uh, there are folks here that can speak to the tireless efforts of the ACTS leadership to petition DOT for years to get the intersection at 74th and 60th signalized so as to slow down traffic and allow these residents to get into their property and out of their property when they take a right out on 60 more safely. Uh, and who can one of you can talk about that? Who's on, who's? I, you I want have a question. I just want to make sure I got this clear. You're asking that there will be uh, an entrance only on Route 60 into the gas station and, and a no exit and oh. keep that turn lane existing? Yes. Okay. Keep it all the way open. Those are our requests. Yes. So what you would like is a continuous turn lane that yes. services both the proposed um, uh, project and yours. So yes. Someone would enter that, enter that turn lane around 74th, and everyone turning would be in that lane. Yes. But there would be no exit out of there. And there wouldn't be the, the concrete, the concrete curb there is really our. We're just afraid that will be the source of accidents again because this traffic pattern has existed for so many years. It is a change to these 850 residents. But on a, on a technical note, you're just asking us to take this part out of the, yes. the approval process, this, the whole traffic pattern out? Yes, and we'll work with DOT. You, you can't govern what DOT does with the project. I, I know you wish you could. <laughs> Dylan's shaking. <laughs> but, but you have made it, you know, Ryan, the conditions of approval that, that John presented at the beginning were these improvements that are proposed improvements that are shown on the plan. To be clear, if I could, the condition merely states that a right turn lane, a westbound right turn lane be provided. It does not specifically say anything <laughs> beyond that. Right. And we would like the county to support us in our efforts to get the safest solution possible for these two properties. And, and is it correct that that is a final decision made by DOT? It is, and that decision has not been made. So. If the configuration were to change, there is a staff level mechanism where we could we could change the plans, yes. The, the condition of the right turn lane serving the driveway is based on the number of trips. Yeah. Anything beyond that, the final design, both in the county's uh, right of way on 74th and State Road 60, these are purely conceptual just to provide a, a visual, but the, the width, length, taper, 
asphalt thickness, line striping, all of those things, there's a lot more detail that goes into the right-of-way permits for both the county and the state for right. each respective turn. So the final analysis is there will be a right turn lane there. The that, final that, format, we don't, we don't know right. what that is right, right. now. That, yes, that's what the traffic study calls for. Mr. Chair, yes. um, I have a different question. Um, could you elaborate, you use the term shielding of light. Can you explain a little bit more what, what your request is? My understanding that there is shielding that can be put on the canopy lights so as to ensure that that light is not bleeding over to the west and to the north. Okay, thank you. And I'm not smart enough to know what that shielding is. I know that it exists. If I, mean, if I could, the, the, the type of lighting that's in the canopy is actually recessed into the canopy. It's, um, it's all LED, very low profile. Um, so it will be, uh, it'll be flush with the bottom of the canopy. So is there a reason that um, Mary hasn't seen the final lighting plan? I, I don't know. No, we. I, what? <laughs> I looked at the. I had the Dropbox link for everything they had submitted, and I looked at it, and it wasn't there. So I didn't think there was one. I asked the applicant's attorney for it today, and I didn't get it. Um, yeah, we have our. We have. Well, we have a number of items, but. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what transpired on that end. Ryan, do you have a copy of it here? I do not. Uh, you, what I do have is, have a copy. yeah, <laughs> sure. I didn't get your request for the lighting plan, if you made one. I left a voice, I uh, got the receptionist and she put me through to your voicemail. Okay, I didn't get it. <clears throat> Ms. Solik, I just have one question for you. Are, do you have any experience as a traffic engineer or any special skill or knowledge in traffic design or engineering? No. I've looked at an awful lot. I've done a lot of eminent domain work and looked at a lot of roadway plans. So what we're showing on the screen here, this is our photometric design. And if we can zoom in enough, you'll see numbers. And that's essentially what the foot candle, L, uh, the foot candle unit is at that specific spot. So what I mentioned before along the west and north, um, it's uh, either zero or 0 0.1. So what we're looking at there, that's the vacant pad. And it's still a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little difficult to read, but the numbers on the far left, the far left column, um, should be all zeros. So that means there's essentially zero light bleeding um, off the property line, which is that uh, line with two dots in it. Including the canopy? Correct, including the canopy. This is for all lights on site. Yeah, so that's the perimeter. If we yep. go back to the... So in our drive aisle, we have anywhere between one and five, and then right off the canopy, you see some of the higher numbers. That's just the, the bleeding uh, from the lights um, underneath the canopy. As we go towards the west, more importantly, looking at the property line, uh, we are essentially zero everywhere. And that holds true as you go north along the entire buffer. And I, and I would say if that is the case, I probably couldn't ask for more. Again, I would, re, I would reassert my, my request for the type C buffer on the west property line because we don't know what additional lighting will be added with the additional use that there is room for on this particular site. And again, we may not get an opportunity to come in and, ha and address you at a public hearing on that issue. That might get approved at a staff level. Clarification was a type C or a type B? That you're I'm sorry, I've keep, I turned them around. A type B. The th thank you very much for correcting me. 
Any other questions for me? Our, our traffic engineer has something to say about the um, the idea that we could do a straight turn line, and he's right. talked with DOT. Would you tell right. him about yeah, so, those communications? Um, our initial pre-application meetings with DOT staff, our original concept did have a continuous right turn lane. And DOT's recommendation, um, and this just is in this district across the state, is they don't um, allow multiple access points off the same continuous right turn lane uh, for the reason that our traffic consultant mentioned earlier. There are, um, there, there's just conflict points that are created. There, there are conflict points that are created when you have two access points off the same turn lane. Um, if we have somebody going to the Western residence and they get in the turn lane immediately, um, and in front of them you have somebody going to the C store, the gas station, they're slowing down to turn in, um, whereas the resident is still thinking he has three, 400 feet ahead of him. Uh, so there's a, a rear end movement that DOT doesn't allow, and that's the whole reason why they required uh, the bump out. And as far as the permit goes, we do not have our DOT permit. However, from a technical standpoint, we have all technical comments addressed through traffic operations. The only thing holding up our notice of intent to approve is a, uh, an easement. They're waiting on additional documentation to show cross access uh, through our site. So the final call on the design of that right turn lane is gonna be DOT. Yes, sir. They're gonna make the final call on that. Yes. And at this point, for this project that staff has put together, it just says there will be a right turn lane. Correct. And, and that's the best we can do. Okay. Right, and we, we, we will take we will take the opportunity to address that issue with DOT. Yeah. I just wanted it abundantly clear that that was not a design that was being approved as part of this site plan. But the design is not our call. Right. If we're just approving the idea that there's going to be a right turn lane, that's all we're doing. We're just approving the idea that there's right. going to be a right turn lane. That's going to be for FDOT to Right. And we don't, dis we don't disagree with that either. Good evening. George Bryan, I'm the Vice President of the Southeast Region of Axe Retirement Life Communities. I'm 5500 Southwest Hosanna Lane, Okeechobee. Um, I'm actually a third generation born Indian River County resident, and I um, just wanted to share a couple of observations that I grew up with um, driving out that route. Um, one, when Bill's TV was surrounded by citrus groves, and it was like an oasis. You wondered how Bill ever lived, and, and look at him now, they're still there. Um, and two, that just watching that migration from being just a two-lane highway, and I used to work way out west at a, a citrus, citrus groves and ranch on 20 Mile Bend. So I drove that many, many times in that dark route, and how um, Miss B's on the corner there was a nice stop on the way back, and the gas station, 76, had the big old 76 bubble, you know, by I-95. It was... It's grown quite a bit, and Indian River County actually has a great reputation on the Treasure Coast for responsible development as well. So I can only perceive or believe that you can understand why the residents um, would, residents of anywhere, you in your home, if they were gonna have a gas station and convenience store built next to you, you'd have concerns. You'd wanna make sure things are done right um, and done responsibly, and the environment is healthy for that. And this is done at a time, actually, as I drove in this evening, you see the skeletal remains of many gas stations that have folded on that same corridor. And listening to NPR and fossil fuels on the out, you know, a different um, school boards going to all electric and, and fossil fuels on the out. So we only know the future of this establishment. I understand your role, though, and I understand where we are tonight. But we did bring a resident representative just to speak the minds of the residents who live on that corner. Because I think if it were your residence and your house was right next door, you would probably want to make sure things are done right too and, just, and find what your options are. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, John Rockhill. John is the president of Indian River State's um, East Residents Association. And he's going to speak on behalf of the residents of the community. John. Vice Chair, I'm by yourself. Thank you, George. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I might add as well that I am nearly a 50-year resident of Indian River County, coming here right out of college. Uh, and I've seen um, much change in that uh, period of time. And just as George uh, uh, alluded to uh, briefly, um, 
In that time, I've consistently seen our elected and appointed leaders place a higher value on quality of life than, on, than over the desires of developers. Obviously, it's our hope that that uh, pattern that's been developed over a very long time continues. Uh, we're not, uh, I re again, as you already heard, uh, In River Estates has 850 residents. I represent 850 residents. In fact, I have a petition here signed by over 520 residents just in the last couple of days, uh, once we found out about this meeting, um, you know, indicating their opposition, uh, you know, to this, excuse me, to this project. Uh, all of our residents are over the age of 62. Um, so we have no young drivers except for our employees. 850 employees and over 400, I mean 850 residents and over 400 employees. Uh, and I might say probably 500, approximately 500 of those residents and all 400 of those employees regularly uh, exit uh, our properties uh, and would be in direct uh, contact with the traffic leaving uh, from this development as uh, proposed. Again, all of our, uh, everyone is in opposition to this pr proposed development of a gas station on the corner of, of State Road 60 and 74th Avenue. Uh, the location, as you already know, uh, directly adjoins our residents and outdoor uh, recreational areas on two sides. We are supportive of appropriate development on this property. We know property will, will be developed initially, but this use is not appropriate and is quite disturbing and concerning uh, to our residents. Locating a gas station on this property is irresponsible and harmful to the residents and environment of this area. The location has an artesian well on it, in addition to being in very close proximity to an ecologically significant lake, which supports numerous birds, animals, marine life, and native vegetation. In addition, in June of 2014, the National Wildlife Federation recognized that Indian River States had successfully created an official certified wildlife habitat. This same organization celebrated the efforts and residents and staff of, of Indian River States to create a campus that improves habitat for birds, butterflies, turtles, and other wildlife, fugators as well, by providing essential elements needed by all wild, wildlife natural food sources, clean water, cover, and places to raise young. A gas station with thousands of gallons of petroleum poses a significant risk to both resident safety and environmental contamination. Scientific American has documented, documented the significant hazards of living next to a gas station. They specifically note ozone pollution, caused by a mixture of volatile organic compounds found in gasoline vapors and from car exhaust. Higher ozone levels lead to respiratory issues and asthma, while benzene is a known cancer-causing chemical according to the National Institutes of Health. Underground gasoline storage tanks are also problematic. All too often, underground leaking tanks contaminate the surrounding soil fouling groundwater. A Columbia University study conducted by a team of environmental health scientists cited the health risk of exposure to hazardous vapors from gas stations. They determined that gas station vent pipes often emit 10 times the amount of emissions that were originally used to determine setback regulations for playgrounds, parks, and schools. These, find, these findings were published in the Journal of Science of the Total Environment. A Columbia University study noted that over a three-week period, the potential evaporative losses from a gas station were between three and seven gallons of gasoline, which is the equivalent of approximately 1.4 and 1.7 pounds per thousand distributed from the pump. The study emphasized that these numbers may not mean much to the average citizen, but they are truly shocking when compared to the figures that were used to determine the safe setback distances. The Columbia study findings also found clear evidence that much more benzene is released from gas stations than previously thought. They noted that people could be exposed to benzene well beyond the setback distance of 300 feet. While the environmental hazards of living in close proximity to a gas station are undeniable, the potential for a catastrophic fire event is a real potential. The National Fire Protection Agency most recently statistical data on fires 
at gas stations indicates from 2014 to 2018 there was an average of 4,150 fires per year at gas stations. In addition, gas stations are an undeniable target for armed robbery. The introduction of a gas station adjacent to our homes will only increase our exposure to crime and in doing so put our residents and employees at risk. In addition to environmental concerns, we have received significant safety concerns from traffic experts on the proposed turning accelerating lane. This will cause extreme hazards to the 500 plus seniors and 400 plus employees entering and leaving in the United States regularly. The developer will no doubt attempt to appease the residents of Indian River Estates by providing minimal concessions. However, no concession will guarantee our personal safety, environmental protection, the invasion of our privacy through noise and light pollution, not to mention our peace of mind. We do not oppose responsible development within our county, but development must also consider the impact on the residents of this county. In conclusion, just because this developer has the required zoning to place a gas station on, on the property does not make it right. Our residents have faithfully served and continue to serve and contribute to this county. Their enjoyment, health, and safety in their final years should not be jeopardized by your allowing the development of a gas station on this property. Thank you. Anyone else? Have you been sworn in? Huh? My name is uh, Richard Martucci, and I'm a resident over at Axe. I'm directly in line with that gas station that they proposed. And having worked in the fuel oil industry, I can tell you this. I don't know if you're familiar with the Texas City catastrophe. One little spark took out a whole city. And you just heard the uh, problems with gas stations and fires. Also, if you realize the prevailing winds there are from the south, which means all these vapors are going to be blowing right into our community there. And there's no way to prevent that. And there's no vapor recovery system which is required at most fuel oil transfers. So that is my main concern. And living there, I don't want to be smelling fumes, and I know I will. You know, and I think it's very irresponsible to put a gas station when you're surrounded by residents, and that's that close. So that's all I have to say. But I hope you'll take this into consideration, because it is going to pose a significant uh, problem for our residents, especially residents that have breathing problems. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Um, having none, um, commissioners, any additional questions? Oh, thanks. Yep, yep, thanks. Is there anyone on the phone that would like to speak now? Ask again. Is there anyone on the on the conference call that would like to, to weigh in on on the uh, proposal here? Oh, it's because my mic's off. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Sorry, one more time. Is there anybody on the conference call that would like to provide any input? There's another lady here. Oh, okay. All right. Have you been sworn in? Come, come forward. Come to the podium. State your name and address. My name is Dolores Carrier. I live at 7430 Willowwood Lane, directly behind the project. My question is, with all this talk about the lighting, where can we go to observe this kind of lighting 
so we know what they're talking about. They're showing us things. We don't know what they're talking about. Where can we go? Great Is question. Is there another place that we could yeah. go to see the lighting? Are there any That's projects that have the proposed lighting that are close by? Anybody know? Yeah, well, I, I probably know. Well, Doug might weigh in, but if yeah. you want. Yeah. I mean, sem well, at the risk of assuming, Doug, I'll let you answer first. Well, and then I was I'll just going to say, we don't have that information as to what, what their lighting plans are. We just know what ours is and what, what our engineer has calculated out. What they're designed to do is show nearly, nearly zero on the perimeter there. So your lighting is driven by code, current code? Yeah, Ryan could probably speak better to that. Yeah, I, again, we, we meet the requirements of the code with our lighting plan for sure, or exceed them. Uh, Nathan Landers, Blackfin Partners, uh, 4440 uh, UJ Boulevard, Suite 600, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, design of that, we, we exceeded what the code was, and again, trying to make sure that the lighting plan was, you know, taken into consideration in the neighborhood. Uh, obviously, beside us, we wanted to be good neighbors. We made that very clear on our TRC meeting on November 25th. Uh, and Ryan actually, uh, they were on the call, Axe was on the call, and asked them if they'd like to reach out to us and make some suggestions. We opened that door and had not heard anything from them since then, um, until today. Um, but yeah, so again, when you're talking about the lighting plan, it's hard for the layman's to understand it. It's just the best we can do is provide you with what's shown there, and that's kind of their you know, regulation, um, you know, it's like a 60 watt bulb, you know, kind of things like that, that, you know, again, it's going to be hard for us to you know, really explain, you know, to, if we got an expert in here or all that stuff. But again, that, that, this is what that is, the candle, what he was talking about and how it, you know, again, it gets down to zero. So there's going to be, you know, zero lighting over there. And again, we've exceeded the landscaping plan. Um, and we feel like, uh, again, the gas station is the only component in question here. The rest of it is, uh, used by right. And, you know, again, we feel like we've, we've done a good job with that. And, and again, every, all, all the other um, items that were brought up, again, meeting code, and, and, you know, that's why, you know, those are established. Same thing with you folks up here right now and why we're here today. So, again, FDOT has done a great job of guiding us. It's not something we pulled out of, you know, a hat. Uh, same thing with State Road 75, working with the county. They've done a great job with us. We've met, as he said, we've met everything, every requirement. Curious to know your uh, thoughts on their request about the uh, operating hours of the car wash from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Or I'm sorry, but not not operating from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Well, the car wash is, is a use by right, so I, I've just tried to avoid going into directions like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you but, think that the use of the car wash at night would be prevalent at all? No, it's, it's doubtful uh, that it would be. Again, it's also shielded by the, the uh, actual um, convenience store over there, so it's you know the furthest from there. Um, it doesn't make a lot of uh, sounds. Um, you know, it's 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 a car wash. I mean, um, so it's, it's there's not much to it. And you know, again, at night, I don't see a tremendous amount of activity. People driving, you know, going to a car wash. So, any other questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. So just to close, thanks again for all your time. Um, we meet all the requirements of the code. We feel that we're entitled to approval. Staff recommends approval, and their staff report is competent substantial evidence that we do meet the code. Um, I'm glad that the residents showed up. It shows they care about their community. We appreciate that. They should. Um, they should be involved. Um, but. Nothing they've said here today is competent, substantial evidence that could deny this plan. The reality is that we hope the residents will come to use our store there and, 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 and find it to be convenient. And so we want them to, uh, uh, to enjoy using that as well. So uh, we'd ask for your approval at this time, and uh, thanks for all your time and involvement and questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't think I dare to ask if there are any more questions, so I'll call for a motion. Well, actually, I, I do have a question. It's All right, well. <laughs> kind of coming at the end here. Um, and maybe I'd ask either Dylan or Ryan, um, 
That request about uh, limiting the hours of the car wash, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., is there anything in the code that gives us the authority to do that if we thought it was a good idea? Let me, let me take a stab, Dylan. Just for what it's worth, we do have a noise ordinance that limits uh, certain activities, certain levels of noise based on certain hours. And um, so to the extent that it does emit noise based on a certain type of activity, and in fact, um, one of in our noise ordinance, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. is an item for, it's kind of kind of old school. <laughs> this, some some portions of our code are a little older. Um, operating radios, television sets, and musical instruments and similar devices, um, you, essentially outside to the to the extent that it causes noise and vibration or disturbance. And it does it so. We have a noise ordinance that, but I don't know. I don't know that the the car wash where it's located and with the building sort of in between that and the community would even rise to the level of admitting those that level of decibels. But we do have that in place. If it rose to the level of creating noise within those hours exceeding the noise ordinance, right? Then something could be done. Yeah, yeah. The options would be to either to limit the operation by by not doing so, or to mitigate the noise one way or the other. Is but that would be once it's in operation and down the road. I don't know if this is a 24-hour convenience store or otherwise, but is there anything in the zoning ordinances that limit whether the hours of operation of the <coughs> convenience store and gas station themselves? No, sir. <clears throat> um, the representative from ACT, the, the attorney, requested that there be a type, if I, if I understood it correctly, a type B buffer along the west side, a greater buffer uh, than we're currently requiring. Is there any, if we thought that was a good idea, is there anything in the code that gives us the right to impose that? If the, if the applicant were amenable to it, they could be acceptable to it, but I don't know that, no, I don't know that we if, have. If the applicant was not amenable, but we said, gee, that's a heck of a good idea, do we have the authority to impose it on the applicant under our code? No, the minimum code requirement between a CN commercial zone property and a, resi a multifamily residential use, which is the, the use mm -hmm. that's neighboring, is the type C buffer. Yeah. So w one thing I'd just like to make a comment. Um, sometimes when residents come to us, they basically say, this is a terrible idea. And, and they present arguments why they think it's a terrible idea. And <clears throat> we're, we're not in a position where we can just decide what's a good idea or a bad idea. We operate within um, the code, the, the county regulations on the subject. If it's authorized, if it's permitted use, uh, and if they meet the criteria, then we, we can't just say, well, I don't like it, so the answer is no. Uh, if we were to do that, they could go to court and get get the result that is allowed under the code. So if we agree or disagree with your ideas, it doesn't necessarily mean, or if, if we don't follow your ideas, it doesn't mean we disagree with your ideas. It doesn't mean this gentleman who brought all the evidence in um, that we disagree or disbelieve you. But we are operating in a structure. And this, if the structure says it's permitted, then we really don't have much choice but to permit it. Um, now, I'm not saying how I'm gonna vote, but I just wanna make that comment because I've sat enough times and listened to residents express why they think it's a bad idea, but that alone is not some basis that we can use to, um, to make a decision. Either it complies with our code or it doesn't. Anything else? Yep. Hmm. Call for a motion. <clears throat> motion to approve with staff conditions. And I would second that. Oh, sorry. Second. Seconded by the. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Eight twelve. It was over before they started. Uh, commissioner matters. Any commissioner matters? None. Uh, planning matters? Uh, I'll be brief as everybody exits. Um, 
just a real quick update from just last week. You guys uh, uh, recommended at your special call meeting approval of the FPL solar site, and the board did uh, recommend approval on two, uh, just, just past Tuesday. So we appreciate you all coming for that special call meeting that allowed them to stay on their schedule. Uh, and, I, and in that same vein, thank you for uh, kind of this being the third week for some of you. So uh, the good news is we're going to try not to have a meeting, uh, the first meeting of May, which is the 13th, but we probably will have a meeting uh, for the second meeting in May. What's that date? I, uh, 20, let's see here, 27th. How'd you know that? Because he said the 13th. And he added 14 way quicker than I could. <laughs> Some sort of savant. I just added 14. Um, <laughs> calendar guy. That's it. I, I think I want to renegotiate my contract. <laughs> uh, you got another? Uh, attorney you, matters? <laughs> Any attorney matters? No attorney matters. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>